Hi everybody, Fraser here, and welcome to our virtual star party for May 13th, 2012, now with our fancy intro graphic. Thanks, Pamela. Someone has to do it. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so now we can, uh, we, we picked up that idea from the folks at the, uh, the Google Plus uh, app development team, and I joined a, a live hangout with them, and they, they put up a, a screen. Uh, before they started the hangout, and it was just like it made so much sense, so we stole it. Apparently, they stole it from someone else, so I don't mind stealing it. Uh, so, well, welcome to our virtual star party. So, we've got uh, two live telescopes tonight. Uh, we've got Gary in Los Angeles, and we've got Stuart, who is uh, outside in uh, in San Francisco. I don't know if Stuart can. Uh, oh, we're going to see windows within windows. There we go. And Stuart is going to bring us Saturn. So why don't we just switch to the beautiful view of Saturn while we while we talk. And then for color commentary, we've got, of course, Dr. Pamela Gay. And we've got uh, Roy Salisbury. And we've got uh, Chris Ridgway. Now, <laughs> Chris has uh, dropped a tree on his foot. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and that has made lugging his... Uh, what, 90 pound telescope around the, the yard, uh, kind of difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. But actually, Chris has been, has been taking a ton of pictures, and he's going to, um, he's going to be showcasing some of these, some of these pictures and showing some of his techniques and stuff. So I think that'll be really cool. And so, and then Gary is going to be doing a bunch of the deep sky objects, and he's got a list of really interesting things we're going to be able to see tonight, including a bunch of new objects that we've never seen before because we're starting to move towards summer now, and so now we're getting all of the great summer constellations coming up, uh, and, the, and some, some of the best stuff to see is only really visible during the summer months, so it's going to be really exciting. Now, the only other thing to warn you as well is Stuart is in San Francisco with the view of Saturn right now, and I know he's been having some, some really bad cloud cover. He's at about 60% cloud cover, so it's more than likely that, uh, that Saturn will disappear, and that's, uh, that's going to be from the clouds. Oh, yeah, but it's good. We can see, uh, I don't know if people can see this while you're watching. You can see, uh, I can see Saturn. I can see a bit of the shadow of Saturn on the, uh, on the rings. I can see some bands across the planet, and I can see the Cassini division, which is the gap, the big sort of dark gap that's visible um, in that was, I guess, originally discovered by, was it by Galileo or was it by Cassini? The Cassini gap was discovered by Cassini. That's Galileo had such bad resolution that he actually thought that the rings weren't quite attached to Saturn. That's right. He discovered the, Saturn, the, the, the ears of Saturn. Yeah. Yeah, the handles. So how, how is your visibility looking there, Stuart? <laughs> oh, he's muted himself or something. I think he thought he was muted and then muted himself, trying to unmute himself. <laughs> trying to unmute himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, sorry. Yeah, so uh, towards the south where Saturn is, it's actually okay. Towards the north, uh, I'm, it's completely socked in. So it, and clouds are coming from north to south. So we'll see. Give yourself about another few minutes and we might lose it. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we, we might get lucky. That sounds good. Um, now, also, I think it's really important uh, to, to know that we've got two really big events coming up in the next couple of, like over the next month, that, that you should really try to enjoy if you can. So the first one is going to be the annular eclipse, and this is going to be, I think, one of the first total eclipses that's showed up on continental United States. But it's not really a total I know, it's eclipse. An, it's an annular eclipse. It's a donut eclipse. It's a donut eclipse. It's, it's special in its own right. Yes. Um, not worth driving a thousand kilometers for. <laughs> if it was total, Gary and I were talking about this beforehand, because he and I are equidistant, right, from, the, from where the path of totality of this annular eclipse is going to be. And I'm in I'm on Vancouver Island, and he's down in Los Angeles. And we both had come to the opinion that if it was a total eclipse, we would have made You'd the You'd be trip. driving to Eureka? I would be driving to Eureka, to Reading, right now, because <laughs> cause that's worth seeing. But, so so um, next Sunday, a week yeah. from today, yeah. there's going to be a solar eclipse that is going to start in Texas, 
passes over the Grand Canyon. So if you've never been to the Grand Canyon, this is the time to go. It also passes over Albuquerque, New Mexico, makes its way across the country to Eureka, just goes slightly south of the Alaskan Islands, cuts its way down almost exactly over Tokyo. It's kind of amazing. Japan is like the best place on the planet to be, and then cuts its way south, eventually go, going over Hong Kong and Macau by way of Taipei. So really right. lots of countries hit along the way. And and the best place, if you go like NASA, if you do a search for like Eclipse 2012, NASA's got a great explainer as they always yeah. do. And the best place to to see it is like right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So And and if you're signed up for the CosmoQuest newsletter, which you should be, um, we we have a link to that in the newsletter this week. And of course we're gonna do our best to try and broadcast something for the other half of the planet that we'll get a chance to to see it at all. But seriously, I mean I, there's there's another site, and I'm sorry I don't have any links that I can hand you out, but but you can actually go and find out an animation you can see an animation for what you're gonna see in your location. Yeah. And even where I live on Vancouver Island, it's gonna be about eighty percent. It's gonna be a phenomenal eclipse. Like Things are going to, you know, if you're anywhere on the West Coast from Vancouver to Mexico and, and inland quite a bit, the sky's going to, you know, going to get visibly dark. It's going to get kind of weird. And uh, I remember, do you, have you ever been around for a total eclipse? Do you remember one, Pamela? Um, so, so I am apparently the bane of all total eclipses. Right. Um, but I did get to see a pretty good annular one from Michigan back in the, the early 90s while I was at Michigan State University. We were up in the upper UP and I remember the best place to get a telescope was out at the end of a dock and then like hop onto the part of the dock that was floating and moving and everyone thought I was insane, but hey, I had the best view. Yeah, there was, there was like an eclipse back in the 1980s that I remember that was visible in Canada and darkened the skies and we all made a big to-do about it and they came to our school and they gave us all eclipse glasses and so on. So anyway, uh, it, you know, if you are anywhere on the west coast and or, you know, in Asia, you should definitely set aside some time to watch it because it's yeah. going to be great. Um, in fact, I, I remember in the last eclipse, I was down in Vancouver, I was down in, like, down on the beach in Vancouver and I'd set up a, I'm such a nerd. Um, I had set up a like a pinhole camera, right? Mm -hmm. I set up this this so I was sort of casting a, a view of the eclipse onto the ground, and people were walking back and forth in the park, and they had no idea there was an eclipse going on right now. Yeah, and so I I had this eclipse, and it was showing you know how much of the of the of the sun was you know gobbled up by this eclipse, and people That's walked by like, what's that? I'm like, oh, this is the eclipse that's happening right now. And they're like, what? You know, like, don't look at the sun! <laughs> I, I actually ran into this really strange situation a couple of years ago. I, I was um, in China for the eclipse that, that was not supposed to be visible from Beijing. We got on a cruise ship, headed out to sea. We got rained on in Beijing, had a great view apparently. Not Beijing, Shanghai rather. And uh, when we got back to Shanghai to fly home, uh, I was talking to some tourists out on the street, and they're like, yeah, we were out playing golf, and it was so weird. We didn't know what was going on. And, oh. and it was just like these, these Americans who just happened to be in the precise right place on the planet, yeah. and it was just so odd. And then we experienced something that people pay, you know, thousands of dollars yeah, to see. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. I still want to go and see an eclipse. I know people get a little crazy for it, though. They get kind of obsessed. And yeah chase them around the world. All right, well, let's get on with some astronomy tonight. So uh, um, I, we'll just leave Saturn going on there, and then we'll see what, what Gary's got uh, up for us tonight. What do you got, Gary? Uh, I thought we'd take one last look at the monkey head. Uh, that's been yeah. my favorite the last few weeks. And I guess as we saw last, last week, your telescope was now probably just about to view the inside of your observatory, right? Yes. It's yeah. so low. It's right down on the horizon, so... I, since we could pull it out, I, that's a one-minute exposure, and I thought we'd uh, wave goodbye to that. Yeah, and uh, and our good friend Howard uh, dug up a great picture a couple of weeks ago that shows the uh, the monkey head right next to an actual monkey, and uh, and you can just see the uh, the the it's absolutely spot on. So I don't know if you can if you can kind of see there's sort of like its nose there. Well, you you've been great to rotate it, which has been great. So, um, but you can see sort of nose there and his eye there and his other eye beside it. So, yeah, adorable little monkey head nebula. And what's causing this, Pamela? 
Uh, this is a, a region like many other nebulas out there of hydrogen gas and there's a cluster of stars within the hydrogen gas that if we were able to see this in color it would be glowing fairly red and it's from the hydrogen getting excited, the electrons pop to higher energy levels and as they settle back down to lower energy levels they emit light in all directions and where we see the dark stripy bits through the nebula that's just thicker parts of the cloud that are blocking the light from going through. And what's your exposure on this? Uh, yeah. 60 seconds. A 60 second exposure. It's fabulous. It's one minute. Yeah. And then Chris, you were gonna uh, you're gonna show us some some pictures that you've done. Yeah. I, do you see one up right now? Yep. Okay. This is a uh, M16 or the Eagle Nebula. Uh, right here. Yep. Yep. I totally see it. I've got it. a uh, thing. There you go. Okay, great. And you can really see the. Is that the? Uh, that's the pillars, right that's there. That's the pillars of creation, there, right? Uh huh. Yeah, that, that's oh, wild. I hope people can see that in this, um, in their in their live view. So now, now just to understand, this isn't live. So no, it, no. It, I took this a couple weeks ago. Chris is cheating. Um, he took yeah. this but he a dropped he dropped a tree on his foot, so he's allowed to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This week, but we but we thought we would sort of show. So so what what went into taking this picture, Chris? Well, um, you know, basically, just with my eight inch meat and my Canon T uh, three DSLR, uh, I think this is about fifty exposures at about twenty five seconds long. Um, I didn't use any filters whatsoever. Um, which kind of surprised me I even got this kind of uh, detail out of it. Um, and then obviously stacked all the photographs and then processed it afterward. Now, did you do it in, in different filters to get the different colors? Because it's very kind of... No, no, I, I just did my... Uh, when I did my processing, I just uh, used the processing for the colors, but I did not use any filters whatsoever for this photograph. Hmm. Yeah, this is just all the camera. So, so this is kind of like what the human eye would see if it could just be opened up and view uh, lots and lots of photons over a long period of time. It's that long period of time. Yeah. That's the catch. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. That's great. I didn't realize. I hope people can see that. Like I said, that you can see those the pillars there. Yeah, I hadn't realized you could see them so well either. That's really an awesome photo. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, I was really staggered that I didn't have to use an H alpha filter or O3 filter or something for this. But well, those really actually well. probably would have made it a lot harder because those heavy duty filters cut out a lot of light. So you need to have much bigger telescopes to be able to use the, the um, narrower filters. Have you tried capturing the eagle, Gary? I had to unmute myself. I was aligning the photo. Uh, yes, I have. And and do you do you get the same view of the pillars there? I mean, you've got that that hydrogen alpha filter on your telescope, right? Yeah, I pulled the pillars out. I don't think I've got it with the hydrogen alpha. I do have the uh, eagle when I was in a dark location, so it was done with uh, red, green, blue filters. Now, do you have really dark skies there, Chris? Uh, marginal. They're not bad, but I do have some light pollution off to the east which is, you know, where everything that I want to photograph comes up at. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's not real bad. I would say I get, uh, I can see naked eye sixth magnitude. And you get the Milky Way at your location? Uh, faint, but yes. Yeah. That's about the same for me then. Here in the city, I'm, I get faint Milky Way <clears throat> on a good dark night. And then Roy is going to, showcase something for us as well. What's that, Roy? That's the same thing. The same thing. So that's your version of it. Yeah. That was with a T1. T1i. Oh, okay. Yeah. Through my 8-inch. And same thing, no filters, just straight? No, nope, straight one-shot color. Yeah. That's awesome. How long of exposure did you do? Uh, these were probably five-minute exposures. Wow. And, and that was you on did the that with a T T1I? Yes. Through that 
That makes me want a tripod that I can't afford. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, he did it through his telescope. Through his I age. know, but you still need a tripod. Yeah, you need a good tripod and a good tracking mount. And yeah. If you start with the tripod, you can start doing awesome stuff immediately. If you start with the telescope, you just stare at the telescope. <laughs> oh, there they are. Yeah. That's beautiful. I didn't. And it actually yeah. looks like an eagle in this particular picture. You can imagine it flying almost straight up, holding a fish in its feet, mm -hmm. and it, its arms are arced in an awkward position, which is very yeah. hard to say. Yeah. I always yeah. looked at it as somebody, somebody holding a dog out in front of them. Holding a dog. <laughs> so there's, there's the dog right in here, and somebody's just holding it out in front of them. I, I, I rescued a turtle from the middle of the road the other day, and I held the turtle out in front of me because turtles, when you pick them up, do rude things. And yes. I, I, yes. That's it. So, so with Gary, I mean, you've got lots of really amazing colors in yours, That's and this is from a dark sky location. This is great. You guys all have, have photos of the Eagle Nebula in the can. just like. <laughs> it's one of the most awesome things to take a picture of. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. This is false color from here in red, green, blue. And uh, if you look at Roy's, you see how big the pillars are. On mine, with my field of view, the pillars are right in here. You can see my mouse going. Yeah. So I can make them out when you look at the picture. I can uh, probably expand it a little bit. You can see it. But this, yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, there they are. So this was taken from uh, the backyard. I didn't think I did, but I went through and looked and found it. I, I got to admit, I didn't know the pillars would look that well without it being Hubble. So I was blown away by it. Kudos to the three of you. I mean, it's yeah. like there's the same object. I can't, we could not have, we did not plan this. But you guys <laughs> were all able to deliver the same object uh, just like that. So that's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's go back and appreciate Saturn some more. <laughs> and Stuart out in the... How's your, how are your clouds doing, Stuart? Poor Stuart. Yeah. And if it's not too much, Stuart, could you also put up an image of the Eagle Nebula? <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe that's a bit too much. Um, no, it's amazing. So, Gary, what's your plan next? Uh, right now, I tried to get the um, Hydra Cluster with NGC 3312 centered on that. And I'm just not pulling it out. It, um, if you look at the direction, uh, it's south of me, and that's where my most light is. Uh, the Ontario Airport and the whole basin gives me a lot of light down there. And I'm just not... Well, I can see several galaxies in here. But if I'm right, Pamela, the Hydra is a neighbor cluster. It's the closest cluster that is in ours, right? Yeah. So, so we're falling into the Virgo cluster. And, and this is another one that's out there. But it's not going to pull out for us tonight, so. No. I'll move on to M13. How's that? that that's awesome. M13 is fabulous. And this is, again, one of those objects that both Perser and I have fought to find with binoculars, and it's just awesome. So I've got one quick question here. Um, so this is from uh, Luca Bodic. And he wants to know what software can you use to connect your Canon EOS to to your telescope? Um, yeah, I can, while he's bringing that up, I can answer it. Um, basically, the probably the easiest software to use it's a program called Backyard EOS, and um, uh, it cost about twenty, twenty-five bucks or something like that. And you can, and the learning curve is a bit steep, but it's Backyard EOS. Um, and you just hook it on, hook it into the side of your camera. I think it'll work with any Canon camera, and uh, it'll it'll capture whatever it is is coming on to the CCD on the camera, and then you can you can actually control the camera from there. So you can say, I want to do um, you know ten two minute uh, uh, um, exposures, and it'll store it on your computer. Right. The the Canon software works just. Just as well as well. But it leaves a gray border around it, and we, we are passionately against the gray border here. Right, but if you just want to take pictures, it'll... Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's true. 
Yeah, it's but the backyard EOS is set up for astrophotography. I mean, that's yeah. what it's designed to do. Right, but just sort of out of the box. I know the Canon w doesn't want to do longer than a thirty-second exposure, and, right? And oh no, no, it'll do it. No, you, you can do the bulb setting. Yeah, you can do the bulb setting with the standard Canon software. That's what I used to use until I got mm. the backyard EOS. So one one thing to be aware of is the Canon software works on a Mac or a PC, but the the backyard. Uh, software that Stuart's recommending only works under Windows, so it's forcing me to find my, my EPC and um, resurrect its poor innocent, it, it, it gets used as a test bed for too many things, and I'm going to rescue it to turn it into a computer. Parallels. Can you see this, Brazier? I've got the uh, software up that we use there. Yeah, so I'll just switch over to that. Okay, yeah, so this is the Canon EOS. Yeah, this, is the, this is the backyard EO software. This is the back, backyard EO software, correct? Yeah. Okay. It, it does. It does a little bit of everything, if I'm correct. Uh, Stuart can tell us a little bit more about what all it would do, I imagine. But basically, all I do is just, you know, up here connect the camera, and then that's what I use to actually uh, start taking the images. And I was actually trying to set up the camera real fast so I could actually show the uh, the way that looks. But essentially, you're, you know, we've, we've talked about this in, in previous nights, that you've got a, a T-ring adapter that you pull off the, the lens of your Canon, so you've just got the body, and then you put on this adapter, and then this adapter connects into your, uh, into your telescope and acts right. like the eyepiece of the telescope, and then from that point on. But if you've, I mean, if you've already got the, the, like a Canon, or, you know, then you're good to go. I mean, that's, a, that's one of the best, uh, you know, ways to just get into this in the first place, as you can see from, from both of their images. Yeah, you can get a, um, just a bayonet adapter, it just goes right onto it, just like your lens would go onto it, and it's, uh, uh, mine is a two inch, and it just sticks right in the back of my telescope, just like you were saying. Yeah, so if you've already got one of those, it's a great way to get started. Yeah, and you can set this up, I, and I just figured this out uh, when I took that, the photographs of the eagle, you can set that, uh, this up to take as many exposures as you want, and just walk away. Set your ISO up, everything. Yeah, and then and then you and then you stack them afterwards, right? And then you stack them afterwards, correct? Yeah, right. yeah. So, uh, Canon should really uh, be sponsoring this uh, show. <laughs> 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 well, and and they're coming out with a new astronaut astronomical camera, um, the Canon. What? What is it, Pamela? That's 60 DA or something like that. Yeah, I yeah. I, I think that's right. Uh, I have to admit, yeah. I sort of went, ah, I just bought a camera and then yeah. blocked it all out. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we'll talk to them and see if they want to sponsor the show. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for everyone. Get everybody cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. Okay. Cool. Well, so let's go back then. I, Gary's got, I believe, something, uh, some kind of globular cluster there. I believe. That is. Oh, and we're losing Stuart's. Uh, oh no, okay. it's okay. That's M13. That is M13. It's been a lot of requests, and yay! Explain it better than I can. Pamela, what's M13? M13 is a cluster of thousands of stars that were all bo that were all born at the exact same time, give or take a few tens of thousands of years, out of a cloud of gas that collapsed down, and it did this during the same period of time that our galaxy was still trying to figure out how to form itself. So what's really awesome is, is globular clusters actually are, are the original pieces of stuff that our galaxy is made out of. Um, they're, they're rather large. There's actually small galaxies that are about the same size and in, in terms of number of stars as the biggest of the globular clusters. And uh, they're just really neat because you can use them as stellar laboratories to study how do stars that are otherwise identical, except for mass, develop over the course of their lifetime. Because different globular clusters will have slightly different compositions. But since all the stars in one globular are all the same age, all the same stuff, when you study them, you're only varying one variable from star to star. Uh, and I have a question, Pamela. Pamela, mm -hmm. since there's so many in such a small area, what's to keep them gravitationally collapsing? Um, they actually have some of the most crazy, complicated kinematics. One of the first, I think it was petaflop computers, was actually developed in order to do a model of, of the kinematics of a globular cluster. And what you have is 
there, there's a number of different things going on. First of all, there's a lot of three-body interactions where you end up with, with a binary star that temporarily captures a third star and then flings it to kingdom come. And that flinging, well, it keeps re-increasing the size of the globular cluster. Um, so you have these three-body interactions and, and there's other interactions that end up just basically throwing things out that later come back in. But it keeps re-energizing the system so that things don't just collapse down to the center. They also have almost no gas and dust, so there's no friction affecting things. Okay, cool. Right, and so I guess the bottom line is there probably were collisions and stuff in the past, oh, yeah. but what we're seeing now after 12 and a half billion years is just what's left, what survived, and what's still going. How many, how many stars do you estimate? I mean, within the oh, closest man. million. I, <laughs> I just, well, I just, I just did no, one about M55, and there was 100,000 stars in M55, yeah. which is another globular cluster, sort of on the same thing. Because you, you look at that and go, say, 155,000 over 10,000 years. It's just how fast were these things being created? Well, it, it, this is no different than when you look at the, the Orion Nebula. Um, the Great Orion Nebula, not just the little one in the sword, when you add up all that star formation, it's pretty vast. Now think about how far away these things are. Mm -hmm. Orion is, uh, I want to say, order of 10,000, order of magnitude 10,000 light years away. These are order of magnitude 60, 70,000 light years away. I mean, just they're so, it's so densely packed. It's just, they're just, yeah. it's just you know, have a time lapse of it going on over 10,000 years, just popping up. Well, the, the amazing point would have, would have been about 30, 50 million years after it formed when you had supernova going off like popcorn. That, oh, that would cool. have just been truly awesome. Wow. Uh, and then, Chris, you've got, of course, an image, a photograph that you took of M13, right? Right. That's fantastic. Roy? And I think... Oh, God. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's about... 30 images. That's not quite as many, but it's just 30 images stacked up. Stacked up. Oh, it's it's beautiful. M13 is uh, is the is the globular cluster that's located in the Hercules constellation, and it is absolutely one of my favorite objects to look at. You know, if you get a small telescope for the first time, especially if it's in the summer, this is going to be one of the objects you're going to be going to again and again, and it's the one that you know when the friends come over and you've looked at the moon and you've looked at Saturn and whatever planets are up and you start wanting to see some other deep sky objects, this one delivers the goods. With a, with a little telescope, it's a beautiful little fuzzy ball of stars. It's, uh, it's, yeah, a, it's an amazing experience. It, it's a lot easier to see than things like Andromeda Galaxy or M51 or any of the nebulas, because these are actually stars. They're pinpoints of light, and you don't end up losing them to light pollution the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, and it's great. I mean, we've been dying to, to showcase it on the star party, but it just hasn't been up in a reasonable time for, for the people that are involved. It. And now we have it. And pretty soon we'll be able to get the Ring Nebula too. I don't know. Do you have the Ring Nebula yet, Gary? No, no, it's not. It's not up. The, the, the ring might be a little small for Gary's scope, though. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. The. I mean, I once. Um, uh, I might be able to get it a little later. Um, when, when I. When I start using my backyard EOS and streaming that, it'll be perfect for Mike's telescope when he gets clear weather. Unfortunately, the East Coast is being punched for summer. Yeah, yeah. They both, uh, Mike and Mitchell, said that they both got uh, rain. It was early, it was better earlier. Now it's just rain. The the superstition in astronomy is clouds are caused by someone purchasing a new telescope. And uh, I, I think the, the, new, the Northeastern Astronomical Forum is coming up, and there's just way too many brand new telescopes being purchased. Being purchased, yeah. yeah. So what's this, Gary? This is NGC 4214, uh, an irregular galaxy that uh, I ran across, and it looked like it would be kind of interesting. But it's also one that's a 60 second exposure. Yeah, I've, I've had the same imaging <laughs> issue you're having right now where it ends up looking like a caterpillar cocoon. And, and there's really nothing you can do to make it look better with a telescope your size. Yeah. So Somewhere on my hard drive, I have almost that exact same image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that so, was shot yeah. One. We'll just go back to Saturn while we wait. 
Although we can hear every movement of Stuart, so we may have to mute you, Stuart. S sorry, I'll, I'll mute myself. It's good, though. I think the Saturn image has gotten a little crisper while I've been watching. Maybe his telescope's had more time to cool down, but I'm seeing a lot more of the, of the detail on the planet. I can see the, the definitely see the bands across the planet. So, so the variations that we're seeing, it's what's called thermal seeing. Um, this, this is what happens when your telescope, the pavement around your telescope, the air inside your dome, isn't the exact same temperature as the outside air. So as the light travels through the air of different temperatures, it ends up bumping all over the place. And when it suddenly hits the new temperature, it sideways. So, so you end up with your image dancing all over the place as it encounters pockets of different temperature air. I'm also getting a lot of wind, too. That'll, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it as well. Yeah, you can you can tell by the image. I mean, every now and then it's 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 breaking up, but you get yeah. those lucky imaging, where yeah. one of one of those frames just comes out really crisp. Mm. And it looks like a cloud just ate Saturn. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's there back. Yeah, yeah. We can't. How how bad does it look now? Is it definitely socking in, or is it uh, just intermittent? Because that that looks great now. It looks fantastic. Gary, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I muted myself. Yeah, I can see, you know, patches. You know, it's it's sort of poking in in between just little patches of clouds that are coming through. So I can see it right now, but in about uh, two minutes, it's going to go away again. So we have yeah. Hugo uh, Luca in, in the comments is saying, is it possible for a planetary system to exist in star clusters? And this is one of those neat things where there's a, it, it's a double-layered question. So when we look at globular clusters like M13, I think we were looking at M55 last week, these globular clusters are some of the oldest objects in our universe. And they have so few metals, so few carbon atoms even, that there's just not enough of the stuff to make uh, rocky planets like the planet Earth. And in none of our observations of globular clusters, no matter how hard we've looked, and we've looked, no one has been able to identify a transiting planet so far. Now that said, we know that there are galaxies out there that still have globular clusters forming around them. And in those systems that are forming at a later date where there are heavier atoms, it may be possible, we're st we still don't understand the boundaries, but in those systems there's at least the stuff that you need to form planets available. Now, we do find that within the disk of the galaxy where there's lots of heavy atoms, um, there seems to be no limits to where we're finding planets, and they are forming in, in star clusters. There you go. Look at that. Get an answer from an astrophysicist. I think you've got a plane going across there, Gary. Uh, I do. That is M63. That's a one-minute exposure. I'm now doing a, a two-minute exposure. Actually, I think that That's is a satellite. A satellite. Mm. Because it's tumbling. A nice trail. I actually was doing some some photographs of uh, the Big Dipper a couple of nights ago. Yeah, those um, were really good. Yeah, and and I was actually caught a, a satellite moving through. So I was comparing three different images I took at different exposure lengths. I was like, oh, satellite. <laughs> Anymore, it's kind of hard to not get a satellite in the picture. Yeah. yeah. I've noticed that myself. Yeah, but when you stack them in, you're never gonna you don't see the trails anymore. Yeah, you do what's called a min-max rejection, where you reject the uh, brightest pixel in the stack and the weakest pixel in the statch stack. Mm, right. Yeah, the, the, the image that I did of M101 last night, it's like every other one had a satellite going through it. Oh, man. Were you, <laughs> but, so, so you were along the ecliptic somewhere? Uh, I have no clue. Where exactly yeah, there's <laughs> there's certain parts of the sky where, depending on where you are on the planet, you are more doomed. Yeah. So if if you're looking towards the part of the sky that's in the same direction that your television antenna is pointed, if you have like direct TV or something, um, yeah, that that's the part of the sky that tends to stack up with satellites. Yeah, and and what's what's interesting is with with some telescopes, they've actually placed demands on. Um, what what cadence they can use to do the observing to make sure they don't inadvertently end up exposing some of these spy satellites out there. Oh wow! <laughs> wow. Yeah, but it had an every other every other one every third one that had a satellite going through it. But once it yeah. got stacked in, I don't see any of them. 
That's, now, did, yeah. did anybody see the picture that uh, Thierry Legault uh, released today? The sun with the Chinese <laughs> space station? That was amazing. That guy's a monster. It's unbelievable. We've got it on the homepage on Universe Today right now. But, uh, but yeah, so he's got to pick this beautiful picture of the sun. Like, it would just be a standalone, amazing yeah. photograph of the sun. The sunspots and, and activity on it, it's just amazing. And then, you know, he's got another little zoomed-in chunk, and you can see it's this perfect silhouette of the, uh, of the new Chinese space station passing in front of the sun. So, so when you actually see his setup, he's got this amazing custom-built uh, drive that can move at much higher speeds and can actually track these satellites. And so what he'll do, but in this case he didn't do that, but he, what he'll do is he'll track these satellites so that he can get um, multiple images of them and then he'll stack them just like they're doing to get a really high-resolution single image of these of the satellites. He, he's the one who's produced these amazing pictures of the space station docked to the to the international sorry the, the space shuttle docked to the international space station. You can actually see astronauts outside yeah. the space station doing a spacewalk. Oh, it's it's amazing. So so he is you know by far one of the most amazing people doing work in this in the space, and he is just completely dominating the. I'm going to take pictures of things that are happening right now. And so what he'll do right is he'll he'll travel around and do the math to know that he wants to get a picture of the space shuttle passing in yeah. front of the sun. And he knows exactly where and when to go to get that image. And then at the right time, he'll, he'll take that picture. It's, um, it's amazing. So like I said, it's on the, I hate to you know, sh show off Universe today, but you've got to check out this article because he's, he's great. And he actually he did a really great interview with Nancy on Universe today in detail, sort of explaining his techniques and, and why this... There's a, some people are actually getting a lot of image artifacts when uh, when they're when they think they're getting images of these these satellites and space stations. So it's yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. It's, that just it's a whole other direction you can take this uh, this hobby. So so this is the longer image, Gary. So and so what was it again? This is uh, M63 called the Sunflower Galaxy. And this I is what. In a little bit. This is what's called a flocculent spiral. You can't tell in this particular image, but if you get a really good image of it, the, it doesn't have normal arms. Instead, it has all of these basically scales. So if you've ever looked closely at a marigold or at the seed part of a sunflower, um, all those different overlying bits are basically how this is, is, how this is constructed. We don't use the word flocculent enough. <laughs> it's an awesome <laughs> word. It is a fantastic word. So Everyone who's watching this was all to use the word flocculent at least once in the in your day. Yeah. And arugula. <laughs> flocculent arugula. Look at that. Look at that arugula. It is just flocculent. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to go back to Saturn. You know, this Saturn is the best that it's been all night. Just stop right there, Stuart. Whatever you're doing, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sitting here trying to figure oh. out how to get this on my iPad, actually. Because I mean, it's it looks phenomenal. It's really good. It does look good. Except for the parts where it kind of skews. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like if you remember the rabbit ear dance that we had to do when we were little kids that next generation will have no memory of where you're basically standing there, ooh, got the perfect view, not allowed to move till the show's over. Yeah. Sometimes the best, you get the best reception if you actually held on to the yeah, rabbit ears. Yeah, that was the most frustrating. Yeah. Pick them up and hold them up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all dating ourselves, aren't we? <laughs> Um, uh, that that is phenomenal. Wow. Now, are you are you going to be able to give us a video or a, a, like a stacked processed image at the end of this at some point? Um, sure. Yeah, I can I can work on that. I um, yeah. I did one last night that I posted. Um, uh, I'll uh, but I can do one from from here. Yeah, even you know when those clouds finally take out Saturn, then you know run a process. I don't know if you you're on a different computer on this one. Uh, I use this one, but I can take videos while we're while we're talking here. Yeah. So so we have a question out on the feed uh, from Jonas uh, Kidane, who's asking for the photography aficionados. Any tips on getting good shots of the solar eclipse next weekend? As far as recommended SLR, and I'm going to assume DSLR settings, exposures, etc. Um, he says he has a 127 millimeter go-to scope with an H alpha filter, or he just said H. I'm assuming he means H alpha filter. Right. Well, he's using a solar filter, right? Yeah, he'll need a solar filter. It's, I mean, yeah. if if he has a um, 
Yeah, he'll, he'd need a... He'd need a so, um, a yeah, filter. the confusion for this is there's two types of H-alpha filters, and I'm not sure which type he means. There's an H-alpha filter that, that it's like what Coronado telescopes use, that under normal conditions you hold them up, and it's like holding a black piece of glass up. You can see nothing through it. And if you have one of those on your telescope, it's safe to do photography. Now, then there's also the type of H-alpha filter that, that Gary has that, that you hold it up, you look through it, and the world looks a little red. Um, that's not safe. Don't, don't try and use that. Um, so if you have the H-alpha designed for observing the sun, um, it, it depends on your camera exactly what to do. What I normally do is I open my aperture all the way up and then step through the different exposure settings. Um, often one five hundredths of a second is a pretty good place to start. Um, but it just depends on your particular system, so you'll have to experiment to find the right exposure time. Yeah, but just make absolutely sure. Make that sure it's the right the, type the, the of H right alpha. Filter. Exactly. Yeah. There's and, and there's some uh, some things online as well that you can do that you don't even need the, the the filters. I mean, if you want to visually do it, you can do these. They're like what's called funnel something or whatever. It just, yeah, it you use a projection. camera. Yeah, it's, it's, you put this little funnel in there with a, a sheet over it or whatever, and it just pro projects right on that that transparency or whatever it is. Right. It's they're really cheap to make, and and you can find instructions online. Just don't look at it. Okay. Right. Yeah, we're gonna look at we're gonna look at uh, Chris's view here. So Chris, can you kind of turn that, rotate this device? Yeah, this is the, uh, I mean, this looks home built. It is. It is. It's it's a home built uh, solar filter, but I purchased the solar filter film. Right. And that's what I use to capture my uh, solar images through the telescope with my DSLR. Can we see some while you're? Yeah. Uh, That'd be great. So people were wondering, someone in the comments was wondering if they could see a link to what I was talking about with the images by, of the uh, space station. So I just posted a link into the comments on the Google Plus thread. Um, but you can also just do a search for, uh, I, I assume I'm saying this right, Thierry, T-H-I-E-R-R-Y, and then Lego, yeah, L-E-G-A-U-L-T, sure. and then <clears throat> ISS. Yeah, yeah what, what you can see is unbelievable. There you go. So imagine that with a chunk taken out of it. <laughs> the whole center gone. Yeah, the whole. Well, it depends where you yeah. go. Mmm, donuts. It's gonna be about right yeah. here. Right from from where I am, it's gonna be uh, sort of the top two thirds gone. Yeah. No bottom two thirds. Anyway, um, but yeah, and look at those like the sunspots. And then the other the other way the the way that we always recommend. Um, if you've got like a like if you go to a garage sale, pick up like an old cheap pair of binoculars, and then what you do is you take the binoculars, cover up one eyepiece if you want, and you want to don't look through the binoculars. No, uh, you want to uh, here, project here. them. You want to project it. So what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to aim the the opening part. You know the uh, the actual aperture of the binoculars of one of the one of the binoculars up at the sun, and you're going to have the the view coming out of the other side of the binoculars, and it's going to be projecting out. And then you put like a white piece of paper on the other side of it, and what you're going to get is you're going to get the sun as this big round white bright region on your piece of paper. And if you look carefully, you could do it tomorrow. And you'll see the sunspots on the sun. And in fact, it's a great time to do it right now because there's so many wonderful sunspots on the sun right now. But what you'll do then is, um, is if you can hold it in that position, or you have a mount or a, a tripod or whatever, and then you can kind of move it around, and you'll be able to see as the eclipse comes in, you'll see the black chunk taking out, taking out the sun. But as I warn every week that we talk about this, um, don't leave it pointed at the sun for too long because it'll actually heat up the optics inside the, the binoculars and melt the glues and stuff and ruin your binoculars. Or if you've got like a spotting scope, it'll, it'll, it'll wreck it. So you just want to use it briefly to do that. If you're going to want to leave something for a long time, you'll want to set up more like a, like a pinhole camera or a... Um, and, uh, and be careful yeah. what you're projecting onto. I managed to set fire to carpeting with a telescope once. 
and I've set forward to construction paper, set fire to construction paper many times. Yeah. <laughs> it's a habit. Everyone has to have a hobby. Yeah, there's this lighting things on fire. Yeah. Um, uh, while we're while we're talking about looking at the sun, we can't overstress the danger. There is um, a gentleman yeah. at my club, my local club, that accidentally looked at the sun through a scope, and he oh. a black hole right in the middle of his eye. Oh yeah. God! Instantly burned a hole. Yeah. That he can't see anything in. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Don't. So you you be careful with that uh, with that filter, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I actually almost made that same mistake that Gary was just talking about. But I, what I done was, uh, I had the large filter that I just showed you on the front of my eight inch, and then I made another filter for my finder scope, and I didn't put it on there yet. And I had the uh, the eclipse glasses that you can get, and was looking through them to actually get a good fix on where the sun was, so that I could aim my telescope. And I looked through the finder scope, and I mean, within not even a half of a second, it burned a hole right through the uh, eclipse glasses and right into my eye. I mean, I moved away fast enough, but yeah, it, it didn't take long. So, wow, yeah, yeah. This the, it it's really really dangerous to use scopes, and and remove your finder or tape over your finder or do something so that you're not tempted to look through it. Right. The best way to line up for the sun is is actually right. if you just remove your finder and you have those two rings, put a piece of paper in front of it and move your telescope until the two rings your finder would normally be in basically have their, their shadows completely line up. You want to use the shadows to align your telescope. Um, I usually use the, the little screws on the side of the telescope to line things up for the sun. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, when I'm using binoculars, I just want to make the binoculars, the shadow of binoculars, di disappear. So it's just yeah. a circle. You don't want any lengthening of the And once you've got that, then you know that it has to be pointed right at the sun. Well, like I said, with a solar filter, I built a second, a second filter for the finder. If you get enough film, you can actually make another filter for your finder, which actually helps yeah. tremendously. Yeah. And so the, and then the other thing that we, we alluded to, there's two big events happening, right? The first is this, uh, it, this, this eclipse on the 20th, and then the other event is the, uh, is the transit of Venus on uh, June 5th and 6th. Right. So, that's like so. This will be your chance to practice your techniques, and then another two weeks later, we're going to have another monumental event in in astronomy. In fact, the last time that anybody living will ever see um, <clears throat> the transit of Venus, well, I guess you know when people come up with all kinds of crazy life extending uh, technology. Yeah, I don't know about you. I'm, I I plan on living forever. Yeah, it's true. In my robot. I don't. Yeah, we'll meet. We'll meet in our robot bodies in 180 yeah. years and see the next Venus transit. But, but yeah. So it's going to be, uh, yeah. Again, you know, ironically or whatever, it's going to be the same place. So, people in about the across the Pacific from Asia to the West Coast are going to get a chance to see this. Now, Pamela, you're going to be in Alaska, right? I'm planning to be in Alaska, and if you're interested in going. Um, RSVP by Wednesday, please, because we're trying to figure out what all we need to do in, in order to make plans. Well, I might be in Mexico. Really? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, awesome. That's something I'm working on. So, yeah, there's an observatory in Mexico that I might be going to. So, anyway, um, I'll keep you posted. Um, so, okay, well, then uh, we haven't even talked about what we're looking at with uh, Gary's uh, view here right now. Okay, I listed uh, some of my thoughts for tonight or what I was going to look for and ask for suggestions and I got a few and this is one of them. This is M51, the Whirlpool. Oh, uh, yeah. So I thought I'd try to go down the list of the requests. I put it out there early enough. Uh, the one I have is Comet Gerard, but I don't know that I can find it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not that exciting right now from what I understand. Yeah, so this is M51. Uh, the second request I got was for the Sombrero Galaxy, so I'll move on to that unless Pamela wants to say something about M51. I, this is a grand design spiral. So this and the last galaxy are sort of the two bookmarks for the different ways that spiral arms form. So here we have beautiful, nicely formed individual arms as compared to this flocculent uh, ones that we saw a moment ago. 
Uh, Gloco Hass asks, do we have any globular clusters in the northern sky as big as the Omega Centauri cluster? No. That's a southern heaven. No, so we don't get anything as big. M13 is, is pretty big. Um, you can't imagine what, he said, I did a shot of it yesterday and it took almost my entire field of view. I can't imagine what it would look in Gary's setup. But the thing is, is that Gary's setup is actually designed to show a massively wide field of view. Yeah. And so it would probably wouldn't look a lot bigger than, than what he had with M13. A little bigger, but but essentially the same, the same thing. Yeah, o Omega Sun is, is a completely weird globular cluster. It's, it's the only one that looks like it might not be a single epoch of star formation. Um, it, it, it is kind of like a borderline failed dwarf galaxy. It, it's unclear quite how it got to be the strange thing that it is. Yeah. Something had to be an exception. That's phenomenal. M51 is, is wonderful, though. Yeah. That's a great object. It really is. Now, are you, yours turned red, Stuart. Is this you low of the horizon, or is just clouds in front of it? No, it's me trying to fart around with it to see if I can... Uh, um, I'm having trouble with my camera in terms of doing a recording for some reason, and so mm. I'm, I'm messing around with the, uh, um, with the settings. And uh, for some reason, tonight, my software is not happy in terms of, of taking an exposure. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, well, I'll fix well, it. Whatever you're doing, it's not working. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted, you know, if you needed a second opinion. Just in case you didn't know. Yeah. That's my official opinion. Um, great. Well, if anyone's got any more requests, uh, and if you know your sky and you know what's up, um, we can't do anything from the Southern Hemisphere, but... Uh, we've got some great astronomers coming online, some folks from other parts of the world. So over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to try and rotate in a bunch of new people, and, and we're going to get some other great views. So um, to try and take some of the pressure off of the, uh, the people who've been here week after week. So we got this, is this a sombrero? Uh, yeah, that's a 10-second shot of the sombrero. I'm doing a 60-second right now. And uh, one of the other requests I got was for M27, but that's not going to be, it's going to be below the horizon for the next hour and a half or so here, so it's not going to be a good one. But uh, we're about uh, 56, almost 60 seconds through into the sombrero. And then Chris, yeah. what are you showing us here? That This is the trip. Is that the tripid? Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of in Orion, right? Mm, no. The trifid is, uh, it, it's around the Eagle and the uh, Lagoon. Uh, mm. It's right around the, uh, the Milky Way when it comes up. So there we go. This is the 60 second, Gary? Uh, yes. Let me uh, adjust it just a touch. You can see why it's called the sombrero. Yeah. It go. looks like a UFO. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe rotate it and then... Yeah, this is one that you almost always see sideways in images. And the difference between this and the last two galaxies we saw was M51 and the, the whirlpool that we just looked at and the spiral galaxy are both face-on spirals. Well, the way probability works is galaxies should be randomly distributed through all possible rotations. And this is one that just happens to be edge-on when we view it. And, or it's actually slightly not edge-on, so we can see one side slightly more than the other. But uh, those thick dust lanes that are through the disks of most spiral galaxies cause this to look like it has the rim of a hat going around. I totally see it. Part of it is knowing what the, the, the Hubble version looks like in your mind, and then you can kind of compare and contrast. I've always found this one is when you, when you stack it, it's just so crisp. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it just, you don't see any, you know, fuzzies in it or anything. It's just perfectly crisp. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, I think we're, uh, we're sort of nearing the end of our hour, and so I think with, uh, with Saturn fading with, uh, and with our objects and our, and our energy, I think we'll start to, to wrap this up. Um, so thank you to uh, all the astronomers. Thanks again to Stuart for braving outside, and thanks to Gary for, for braving his, uh, his computer room to, to get these amazing images. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and thanks to Chris and, and Roy for, for delivering their photos uh, as well. These are great. Wow, this, is that the owl? Oh, and now Gary's switching to photographs. So. The one that I have, <laughs> the one that Gary has. <laughs> Gary. I'm you're, cheating. The, you're cheating too. Oh, well. They're all cheating. It's Stuart, fine. Again. Stuart, I'm not. Though. Yeah, Stuart's hardcore. Stuart's live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cheating. Yeah. True, true. And, among us. and thank you, Pamela, for bringing the science. So, uh, My pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for showing up, and, uh, and we will see you next week. All right. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.